So I'd like to introduce Paul Shaw, a partner of Business Doctors. He's former managing director of lastminute.com. He specializes in helping small business owners to develop growth strategies to enable them to achieve their vision. With over 30 years of business experience, Paul has helped organizations large and small to clarify their goals and build actionable plans to reach them. He's also CEO of Restaurant Collective, a new member-led community of restaurateurs and industry professionals whose mission is to provide export, expert advice on running the business side of their restaurant, as well as giving them access to tools and resources. Please do post your questions in the chat box for the question and answer session afterwards. And uh, we're now going to mute everyone and it's over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen, if I can get a thumbs up just to, uh, to make good. Excellent. That's a good start. Now, there is a possibility that my um, uh, audio might cut out occasionally as I'm doing this from 4G. So what I might do is just um, turn off my video just to make it easier for you to see. Um, so um, let's dive in um, really quickly. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is um, the, the sort of steps that you need to go through to um, build freedom uh, in uh, your business and, and look at whether um, you want to sell your business. If you do want to sell your business, what are the, the factors that you should consider? Or if you would prefer to just sort of take a step back from the day to day running, uh, those same factors um, do come into play. Um, so um, let me dive in because I've got quite a few slides and not that long. Um, today's workshop really is about um, uh, understanding uh, what it is that, that, that makes up your business, what it is that adds value to it. The first thing that we, we really want to do um, is, is avoid the owner's trap. The owner's trap, I'm sure many of you have, have come across it, is when you are stuck in the business, the business uh, runs you rather than you running the business. You uh, spend all the hours that God gives in the business. You have personal relationships with all your customers. You do all the selling. Um, you probably offer too many products and too many varieties of different products because your customers ask you personally for different variations. Um, you're the only one really that understands the nature of the business, what your customers want, uh, and um, your staff aren't really of that much value in in the the grand scheme of things because they don't know enough and they haven't learned enough so what we really want to try and do is is avoid that and and build um freedom uh freedom which gives you um options freedom is all about choices it gives you the choice of whether to scale up your business to grow it further and generate more revenues whether to sell a business to to an external buyer or whether to take a step back uh, and become a non-exec or pass it on to family members uh, or, or employees that can carry on the running of the of the business uh, whatever um, you choose you want uh, to do um, you really should be looking at um, eight factors uh, that will drive the value of the business as you as you go forward and these these are they um, and what I will do over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes or so is go through these eight uh, different factors to uh, just give you a sense of, of what it is that drives the value of the business and, and how you might be able to achieve uh, that freedom. And at the end of the, the session, um, there is a link which I will put in chat to a questionnaire, which if you want to find out how you and your business score against these eight factors, uh, you can complete a very quick a uh, 15 minute questionnaire and uh, and get an answer uh, more or less immediately. So the the first of these eight value considerations is about the uh, financial performance of your business. And I guess this is a, an obvious one, really. Um, when you're looking at building a, uh, a sellable business, um, really what a buyer is interested in is how much revenue you make in terms of profit, what the profit of your business is, and how reliable are those revenue streams going to be in the future? In other words, if I, if I look at next year's profit, you know, I might, make, I might be predicting £100,000. The year after that, have I got any certainty that I'll be able to make the same amount of money? Or the year after that? Or the year after that? 
because fundamentally that's what a buyer is looking for. An external buyer of any business is going to look at what are the revenue streams today? What is the profitability today? And uh, what evidence is there that that profitability is going to continue over the course of uh, the coming years? And that then feeds into um, the multiplier that, um, that buyers put on the business. So depending on what kind of business you are in, uh, there will be varying different multipliers that apply to different kinds of business. But the more efficient and more effective uh, your business is, the more you can guarantee future revenues for that business, the higher that multiplier of your profitability will get, and therefore the greater the value of the business will be. The second factor is um, growth potential. Uh, and and uh, this is really the, the, uh, the piece about what is it that you sell and how scalable is what you sell. The secret to a valuable business is very often uh, selling fewer things to more people, being able to develop a, a, a sales uh, process that isn't dependent on you that is teachable to others, to your staff, that is aligned to the highest value uh, perception that your customers have, in other words, that you, can, uh, that you can charge the most for, and is repeatable, that it's a recurring revenue stream. And let, let me give you an example of that with a business that, that we work with at Business Doctors uh, a few years ago, and it was a photography uh, company. Um, what we did is we looked at the various different business streams that they, they had, and we, uh, we rated them against those three factors, teachability, value, and repeatability. So, uh, and each of those factors, we gave a score out of 10. So, for example, weddings. Wedding photography is extremely valuable. You can charge a lot of money. It's quite teachable. Um, you can teach a, a junior photographer all of the standard setups, uh, they're not necessarily going to have the, uh, you know, the, the experience to know where to capture shots, but it's pretty teachable. However, it's not repeatable um, unless you're very, very unlucky. Um, so that scores low on repeatability, but pretty high on the others. Total score when you add them up 16. Then we looked at um, sports teams uh, and in this particular example, football clubs where um, team, team photos are taken every year. Uh, and they're pretty standard, you know, front row kneeling, standing in front of the goal, uh, another row standing up behind. And uh, that, that's your standard uh, football team shot. Uh, it's very teachable. It's very repeatable because you get a new team every season, but it's not particularly valuable. No one's prepared to pay a huge amount for it. The third one is school photography. Um, now, school photography, again, formulaic, very standard, very teachable. Uh, very repeatable because your kids go through, you know, whatever it is, 12, 13 years of school. Uh, and it's extremely valuable because everybody wants to buy the photos of their kids every year at school. And you can get them on key rings, you can get them on coffee mugs, you can do all sorts of different things with them. You send them to your relatives. So that scores very, very highly on that, uh, that uh, value uh, uh, scale. You add all of those up, and what that led to is this, this particular company specialised uh, in school photography, and they, they actually rebranded uh, their business to schoolphotographs.co.uk, and they're doing very well, or at least they were pre-pandemic, um, doing pursuing that particular um, specialism. Doesn't mean they don't do the other things, and that's where the focus is, because that is the, uh, the, the, um, the growth potential of the business. Moving on to factor three, and we call it Switzerland structure, because this is all about independence. Uh, and the aim here is to achieve neutrality, to not be too dependent on any single element of your business, be they suppliers, be they customers, be they employees. Um, so, for example, if you if you have a too high a dependency on, say, a, uh, a customer, you might be dependent on them for 50% of your revenue. Um, that's a huge vulnerability to your business, particularly if you don't have a contract with them. And I've come across uh, many clients that, that are in that situation. They're reliant on a particular customer for a huge proportion of their business. They don't have an agreement with them. That customer could choose another supplier tomorrow 
and they would lose half their business overnight. That is an absolute um, uh, alarm bell for any prospective buyer. So the objective is to look at your business, look at where you have those vulnerabilities and reduce those vulnerabilities wherever you can. You might be over reliant on a particular employee who knows all sorts of things about stuff nobody else knows about and you've got a vulnerability there the supplier you get all of your goods from a single supplier if they go out of business you're in trouble and we've spoken about customers so so look at um, where you can reduce your vulnerabilities there then we have uh, the next consideration number four is the valuation seesaw uh, and this is about um, how you um, use your cash how you use your working capital in your business. So there is a direct relationship between the amount of cash that your business employs day in, day out, and the value of that business. The more cash that you need to operate the business, the lower the value. And if you think of it in terms of a commercial buyer who is buying um, your business has to write two checks, one for the business that they are acquiring, and two, to, to finance the cash flow of that business whilst they uh once they acquire it so the lower the the amount of the uh the check that they need to finance the working capital the higher the value of the check that they can write to you to acquire the business so the more that you can reduce the 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 the, the cash requirements of the business the greater the impact that has on value Number five is about recurring revenue. And we've touched on this already. And again, it comes down to this, this, this perception that any buyer has that um, they need to have some confidence that the revenue that they are buying in your business is going to recur year after year after year. Let me give you an example of a security company that does two things. They do uh, installation and they do monitoring and maintenance. Now, from a buyer's perspective, installation, it's a one-off activity. So um, they are going to pay you 75p for every pound of revenue that your installation um, brings you. However, the maintenance and monitoring, they can see as an ongoing revenue stream. So the value to them is much higher. And they would charge, uh, they would pay you two pounds for every pound of monitoring revenue that your business generates. So in other words, a business that is purely monitoring is worth two and a half times the value of a business that purely specializes in installation. So that gives you a sense of why recurring revenue streams are important. But what actually are recurring revenue streams? Well, consumables that people get into the habit of buying, your Starbucks or your Costa on your way to work in the morning. Um, next up is, is um, when you buy a product, but you're committed to buying consumables um, to, to fit into that product. So in this example, it would be uh, the coffee pods for an espresso machine. Another one would be a magazine subscription where you subscribe um, to, um, to receive um, content from a magazine for a period of time. Um, or a subscription revenue for something like a Bloomberg terminal where you buy the hardware and then you get access to uh, the content uh, from Bloomberg. Auto renewal subscriptions, things like HelloFresh, um, Gusto, they're very popular at the moment. Uh, Netflix is, is another great example. And at the very top of the tree, uh, most attractive to prospective commercial buyers, multi-year contracts where a, a, a customer is obliged to purchase from you for a number of years into the future. Moving on to number six, uh, and we call this monopoly control. This is really all about your point of difference, your USP. What is it that differentiates you as a business that gives your buyer um, the, 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 the confidence of knowing that you stand out from the crowd in some way, that you have something that is going to continue to attract customers to uh, the organization that, that you run. Um, now, you can, you, can, you can differentiate in a number of different ways. Cost is an obvious one. In other words, be the, the, uh, the lowest priced option. Um, that can be a real challenge, particularly for a small business, because there's always a bigger guy that can, that can cut their margins uh, lower and sell higher volume. 
uh, you might operate in a particular niche. So uh, you have a, a particular skill set that it's very hard for competitors to acquire. And therefore, any customers that need what you do will come to you. Uh, and it's a very defensible position. Uh, very often, small businesses um, uh, differentiate through things like quality and relationships uh, and peace of mind and, and those things that they are able to uh, give to their customers through their attention. Um, but it may be that, you know, if you are, um, if you're something like a, uh, an Uber Eats or a Deliveroo, uh, where you're a disruptor, you're doing something different to uh, the way things have been done in the past, then you can, you can acquire differentiation in that way. Uh, whatever it is, it's a, it's a good idea to spend a bit of time thinking about um, what your point of differentiation is, how you stand out from the crowd, how you differentiate yourself from your competitors, um, and, uh, and focus on that as you go forward, because that will be very attractive to a buyer. Uh, number seven is customer satisfaction, how your customers um, relate to you, how they feel about the products and services that you provide. Quite a difficult thing to measure. Uh, one of the most popular ways of measuring that is the uh, Net Promoter Score, designed by a guy called Fred uh, Reicheld, who used to work for Bain Consulting. And uh, he, he came up with this measure, um, which is a very, very simple uh, approach. You simply ask your customers on a scale of one, uh, sorry, zero to 10, how likely you are to recommend the company to a friend or to a colleague. Uh, and then you, you group the respondents into three categories. Your promoters would score you a nine or a 10. Uh, those that are passive, that don't really care one way or another, would score you a seven or an eight. And those that really don't rate you all that highly at all would score you anything from naught to six. And all you do is you take your percentage of promoters and subtract the percentage of detractors from them, and that leaves you with your net promoter score. So if you've got 25% of respondents uh, score you a nine or a 10, uh, and you've got 5% of your respondents scoring you uh, naught to six, then your net promoter score is 25 minus five, so 20%. Really simple, really straightforward, very quick and easy for your customers to answer. Um, it's a really important measure because one, it's widely adopted. Uh, two, it's a forward looking measure. Um, you can look at PL, you can look at balance sheet. They're all backward looking measures. They can tell you what the business has done. It's not going to give a prospective buyer any sense of what the business could do in the future. And the people that can tell you that really are your own customers. Uh, a lot of people use NPS these days. It's, uh, it's, it's very easy to do, it's very easy for, um, uh, for you to publish, and uh, it's a great guide for a prospective buyer. And uh, the final uh, of the eight considerations is what we call hub and spoke. Um, and this is about um, how you, as the owner of the business, I, uh, how closely you're involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. The more involved you are, the lower the value of your business, simply because if everybody and everything depends on you for a decision, for an action, be they a customer, be they an employee, be they a supplier, then uh, your business is essentially worth nothing if you're not in it. So uh, a big part of uh, preparing a business for sale is to understand how you can remove yourself from it, from all of the key decision-making operational processes that, that, that go into making the business run from day to day. Um, so that's a, a very difficult one sometimes for small business owners to, um, to, to, um, to manage, but it's incredibly important because that will really, probably more than any of the other factors in many ways, drive the value of the business going forward. So, just a final uh, sort of point to make is that profit and value are two um, very different things when it comes to um, selling a business. The profit that you make is only one factor amongst the eight that really drive the value. And the, the, the difference between profit and value can be huge. I mean, in this, 
example, a lot of numbers I know, but essentially what we're looking at here is um, a, a business that, that has an annual profit of 150,000 um, pounds. You know, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice profit. Um, but uh, if, if the, that same business scores very highly across those eight different factors, its valuation to a commercial buyer could be as high as a million. Whereas a business that, that uh, has double that profit, 300,000 pounds, if it scores very low against those eight factors, could have a valuation of only 750,000 pounds. So, you know, 25% lower than the business that generates half the profit. So it's really important to, uh, to make sure that if you're thinking about selling your business or, and this is a really important fact here, that you know, even if you're not thinking of selling your business, having a business that is efficient, that is effective, that, that scores highly against each of those eight valuation criteria gives you a, a much, much more valuable business, which if you then chose to sell it at some point, you could. If you chose to take a sabbatical, sabbatical and go off and, and, you know, tour South America for six months, you could because you would have confidence in knowing that business would be able to run efficiently and effectively. Uh, and that's what freedom is all about. It's about giving you uh, as a business owner those choices. And uh, as I mentioned at the top, uh, we've got a questionnaire that you can take, uh, which is a value builder questionnaire. You will be able to score your business against those eight factors, around 40,000 businesses across um, uh, UK, Europe and North America have taken this survey. And, uh, and of course, we're able to benchmark the answers against uh, the statistics given us by all of those uh, different businesses. So it's a pretty accurate measure of uh, where your business is today, what its value actually is today, and what it could be if you were to increase your value builder score. So I will put this link in chat uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. And uh, if anybody has any, uh, any further questions or would like to chat more about value builder and, uh, and business growth, then please uh, do uh, get in touch with me. You can see my details on the screen there. Uh, and that concludes uh, this presentation. If anybody does have any uh, questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Well, thanks very much, Paul. That's really, really interesting talk. Thank you mm. so much, that's great. Uh, yes, there has been uh, some questions in the chat box. Uh, from Karen Young. Karen, would you like to uh, pose your question to Paul? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, so we don't tie customers into contracts because it's part of our brand ethos that we deliver results through Google Ads. And, you know, I, I've set up ethos as the antidote to companies that tie people in for 12 months and then, you know, try and hold people to contract. So our clients tend to stay with us unless there's a specific reason why they leave you know they're bought out or whatever you know they, they don't leave because they're unhappy with service we've never had a customer lose, leave for that reason mm. and our model is 100 percent recurring revenue so we have proof that you know we've been in business for four and a half years and i've got customers still from the beginning yeah. does it then matter if you don't have contracts Uh, well, I mean, I mean we, I, we have contracts, but not we 30 day terms, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes. I think if you have a convincing and a compelling story and a reason why you don't have contracts and you have a high level of confidence that the fact that you don't have contracts, you know, generates good business and uh, allows you to generate recurring business, then you know, arguably, no, you don't. I mean, this is, this is you know, a, a, a formula, if you like, it's a template. Um, you know, a, a buyer that knew nothing about your business and was buying blind and had no background would expect you to have contracts. But of course, no buyer does that. Every buyer does their due diligence, it looks into your business, talks to your customers, understands the, 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 the model and the rhythms of the business, and then will then make their purchasing decision based on that. And 
by the sounds of what you what you have at the moment i think you know you you would probably it could potentially be damaging to your business to introduce contracts um because there there's an element of of client trust there yeah. that, that yeah, would exactly. would be would be impacted so um no i mean i wouldn't recommend that you you change your model um but i think you know what is what is important is that you gather if you were thinking of saying you gather sufficient evidence to um to to convince and satisfy a prospective buyer that your model is safe and secure and that their expectation of future revenues is 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 well placed Great. Thanks. Great. Um, any more questions? Yes, Jane. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you have a feel for how long it takes somebody to, to go through that path and get ready? To so, um, yeah, it's a really good question, Jane. I think um, it, it does depend on the, the condition of the business at the beginning and the size of the business and the, uh, the nature of the business. I mean, typically, I would say going through the process of building uh, 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 building the business to, to score highly against each of those eight factors is probably the work of a, of a year to 18 months. Um, it could be a bit longer, uh, could be a bit shorter, depending on what you do. Selling a business um, usually takes between six months and a year. Um, again, it can take a bit longer. Um, depending on what you do and uh, what kind of sale you're looking for, whether you're you're going out to the market, whether it's a trade sale, uh, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, around uh, 12 to 18 months to actually prepare for sale and another six to 12 to actually sell. Great, any more questions at all? Okay, I've got one. You say that no one customer should make more than 15% of revenue. Do you have advice uh, to businesses on how they can get to that point? Because, uh, because you know, the, the, um, the, you know, there is a likelihood that somebody might, a business does have a very big client and they're very dependent on it. So how can they perhaps get, have something a bit more balanced? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, 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 again, it's the case with a lot of small businesses that they do have a very high reliance on a particular client. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that you should then sort of, you know, um, dump that client and go and find lots of small clients. It, the, 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 the trick, I think, is keeping that client whilst at the same time building up a, uh, an additional client base that de-risks uh, that client for you. Um, the, the concern is the vulnerability that it presents to you as a business. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you should take whatever your business, you should take steps uh, to reduce any vulnerability that you have, whether you're intending to sell or not, because it can be incredibly dangerous. And uh, you don't want to put your business in, 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 that, in the way of that kind of risk. So, um, you know, put, putting a contract in place is a good starting point. So making sure that you've got some kind of uh, security. But, um, you know, really the only answer is to, to find new clients to, to, to de-risk that, that one that you're over-reliant on. Okay, then. Thank you very much, Paul. Right. Anyone got any more questions? Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that great, great talk. If anyone wants any more information, do contact Paul directly. So that concludes our meeting and feedback is very important to us. So do engage with us on social media, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. And please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. So our next meeting is on Wednesday, the 9th of June at 11 o'clock in the morning, when Karen Young from Ethos Metrics will be presenting an insider's guide to Google Ads success. And Karen's with us here today. So Karen, perhaps you'd like to give us a, a, little, a little taste of what we can expect. Yeah, so really, um, Google Ads is seen as a black art, black art by many people. There's a lot of distrust in Google Ads. A lot of businesses invest in Google Ads and lose a ton of money. And it's not really surprising when you're on the other side operating the platform because Google sets things up to lure small businesses in. You know, they tempt you with, you know, we'll give you £120 worth of free clicks if you set up an account. It's really straightforward. Just do this. And people forget that Google actually is looking to generate money for Google. Google makes money from clicks um, because you pay per click. Literally, every time your ad shows and someone clicks, you pay. You don't make money from clicks. You make money when people buy things from you as a business. 
and it's understanding the difference between Google's motives and your motives as a business, which enables it to be possible to make money from Google Ads. Um, it's a really complicated platform. People often don't know what they're buying. So really, our aim as a business is to demystify things so that people can make a considered decision as to whether Google Ads are ever going to be right for them. And the answer is, for a lot of businesses, don't touch them with a barge pole. You know, we, I tell an awful lot of people every day, that, you know, every day of the month that not for you, go and do a different sort of marketing. So um, what I'll be covering really is top line, how the Google platform works, how, whether, you know, how to assess whether it's right to be right for you as a business. And if you do decide to go ahead, how to go and get your eyes open. Great. Well, that sounds absolutely great. Thank you very much, Karen. So if you'd like to book for that, do visit our website, www.wearebiz.co.uk. Well, thank you very much, everybody. So that's goodbye from me, Rob. Goodbye from me. And <laughs> goodbye from Dave. Goodbye, and um, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank goodbye. you. Thanks.